Welcome to The Woman's Connection. I'm Barry Louise Switzen, your moderator. The Woman's Connection is a program about events shaping women's lives and helping one gain authentic power on a personal or professional level. So won't you stay tuned? Welcome. It is a topic that we need to address because if you're not prepared for what's coming down the pike for you or 90% of the American population can be very detrimental and you'll be floundering in a sea of unknown. And the topic that we're going to discuss is caregiving and what you should know about caregiving for yourself, for your parents if you need to, and or your children depending on the situation. And I would like to welcome Gloria Barsimian. Gloria, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. You have been in the caregiving field for over 22 years. What do you see happening today that people are not addressing or they're addressing for caregiving? Well, right now I think it's going to be difficult for the people who are doing caregiving, especially with the economy the way it is, and with all of the questions that are going on in the country about our insurance coverage and about medical care, and I think one of the things that we need to start doing is start talking about uh, what our loved ones would like in the event that they become ill or incapacitated or need rehabilitation. And starting a conversation about this sometimes is very difficult for families because the routine has been that no one has talked about it for a long, long time. Well, how do you address that issue? Because parents, some are very giving and open to their children, and they say, here's all the information you need about us, so that if, God forbid, anything should happen to us, you are prepared. But most of the people do not address it. Oh, another time, another time. Well, all of a sudden, another time becomes now. How do you overcome that hurdle? Well, I think you just jump in start the conversation very casually and let your loved ones know that it's to their benefit that you're having this conversation. It is to their benefit that you know uh, where, their, um, where the wheels are, what they own, uh, what kind of medications that they take daily. Start off with asking them, do you feel safe in the home? Are you able to maintain your home? Is the gardening too much for you? And that will lead into other conversations. In families who have not talked about this, it may take a few tries. The first time may be just the beginning, and they, you may have some flack, and they may not, they, your uh, elder family may think that you're trying to take over or uh, letting them lose their independence. And eventually, it'll come that they'll start talking about it. And in the meantime, while you're doing this, you will find the most wonderful stories that your own family is telling you about. Start with asking them about their histories or asking them how they cared for their parents. Um, and let them know that it's a two-way street. First of all, be prepared and know the, what you're talking about. Like, you know, the cost of nursing homes today are like $70,000. To go to a, an assisted living, it would cost about $40,000. Um, so, you know, some families feel, I, my experience has taught me that once the person starts talking about it, a whole burden is lifted from their shoulders. Someone else is trying to help them. And if they're difficult, and if you've had a terrible relationship for years and that is impossible, then let someone else do it. Oftentimes, what I found in, in the beginning of my work, I used to ask the sons to do it, because somehow mothers and fathers listen to sons. But now women are getting more into asking questions. Well, what is the first thing that they should be doing, or you should make sure that is in place for your parents? Well, I think the first thing is to know their medical condition, to know about what kind of medications that they take. Do they have a lawyer? Do they have a will? 
Um, are, they, are they comfortable in their home? Is it too difficult for them to maintain the garden and the home? Are they able to do the grocery shopping? Do they need help? What do they need help with? Eventually, you know, the private things will come out once they feel comfortable that you're really asking these questions not to be quizzy or to take over, but to help them. What about a power of attorney? How important is that, and when should you pursue making sure they have a power of attorney? I would make sure that they have a power of attorney before they got sick. Because oftentimes in the hospital, I had to be a, uh, we had to get a power of attorney. Most people did not have it. Um, so in the event that your loved one cannot respond, it's a, a wonderful document to have, a power of attorney. Is there a certain particular, is there a particular time that you suggest that you yourself should have a power of attorney, a health care proxy, a, a, a will, or anything else, last wishes? Of course, you know, I think you should have it uh, as soon as you can. You know, people get married and they have a, a what is it, this uh, document that when you get married, uh, what your husband has, you have and you share. Well, you know, a husband and wives usually talk about that. The elderly usually talk about it, and they don't tell anybody. Uh, and it's important that you have all of these things in place, because should something disastrous happen, estate planning is a wonderful thing to have had done. Otherwise, all of the tax, all the money that is save or go to taxes. So I, I think it's one of the first things, it, it's one of the first things that we should all have in place. Power of attorney, um, a will, um, and also what you would like in the event that you become incapable of taking care of yourself. Is a nursing home out of the question? Would you want to be taken care of home? All of these things are possible today, as long as you have money. And some people don't have money, so there are other ways of doing it. And also, it's important to have a community of people who are supporting you, both the caregiver and the care receiver. You know, as a caregiver, it's very, very uh, stressful. And to have someone lift you up every day while you're doing this is a very critical thing for the caregiver. The care receiver also needs uh, ha uh, a support, support system besides their children or the caregiver. A, a group of friends, a neighborhood, a community. I was just going to ask you if there was a special area people can go to contact to find out what is available in their community. Every community has um, a council on aging. Every community has a caregiver support group. Every, there are hundreds of sites on the internet. Uh, there is a spousal caregiving support group, clergy, the um, mostly even assisted living places and nursing homes will have, have people. There are also uh, attorneys specializing in elder care and elder law. You wrote a book called Sustenance and Hope for Caregivers of Elderly Parents. What made you write the book? Well, I was a social worker in a hospital, the Leahy Clinic Medical Center in uh, Burlington, Massachusetts, for 28 years. And for 28 years, I worked with families, adult children and their elderly parents, and many other families regarding discharge planning. And what I was coming across for year after year after year, that adult children were feeling hopeless, helpless, they weren't prepared, they knew nothing about their uh, family's uh, situation, and the ones that did seemed to fare well, even though they knew a little, but there was a lot of stress involved. So that, to me, was not enough, so I conducted two research projects at the Lee Clinic. The first project included adult children and their elderly parents called care, 
care arrangements for an elder who counts. And what I noticed during this time as I was talking to families that um, grandchildren seemed to be the medication, better than medication, when they would come and visit their grandparents. Uh, you know, a, a grandparent could be lying in the hospital sad and very depressed, and all of a sudden they would see their grandchildren, and all of a sudden there would be this smile on their face. So I decided on another project called Care Arrangements uh, for uh, Elderly Parents, but I included the grandchildren. And I found that the grandchildren seemed to be pretty much, in my um, questionnaire, the grandchildren seemed to be pretty much, their questions answered pretty much like the grandparents. And the adult children seemed to be a little more, um, not as close in relationship with, the, with their answers. So I made a decision to write this book because I felt that we needed a new way of thinking about caregiving. That you're not, I, I would like people not to say, oh my God, I can't do it. I mean, I hear it all the time. Oh, I can't even, I can't even think about how I'm going to do it. Well, I'm saying you can do it. And it's a very rewarding, spiritual, compassionate thing that happens to you and your whole family. Remember, children are watching, and their grandchildren are watching what's going on, and that's what they learn from what they see. So I decided to put this on paper. And I wanted it to be a little different than the other books that are out there, because they're talking about their experiences. And that's why I conducted the research, because my experience wouldn't be enough. And then what made me really write the book was when I went through the experience of caring for my own parents and then my husband. So that changed a whole perspective that I had and made me work differently in my job and made me understand that we needed this book to start reinventing, I call a chapter reinventing caregiving. You know, we reinvent ourselves as we grow older I reinvented my own self as I grew older. Uh, and why not reinvent this caregiving that people are really worried about and afraid to take on? Because once you take it on, you become a more compassionate person, and the compassion sort of goes out throughout a whole family system. So how did you reinvent? You're saying something about spirituality and grandchildren playing a more important role role in this caregiving yes. process? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I don't expect the grandchildren to do hands-on care for their uh, grandparents unless they want to. But I think being part of a, a whole community of family and relatives, a little bit like the old way, but in a new way, where it's done in a different fashion. The caregiver has a plan. She's going to talk, or he, now we have 44 million men right now. Uh, and so you make a plan should your parents become ill, or should they need a hospitalization, or should they live with you, or should they go to a nursing home. And you know, the plan is you make it at one point, and if, if they get, as things change, the plan changes. We've never had a plan before. This is all brand new territory. You know, we've kind of, families have taken care of their own, uh, uh, mostly. Um, you know, most caregiving is done uh, uh, by uh, uh, families. Uh, and you know, I think the other thing I, I wish would change and why I wrote the book was that nursing homes, there's a lot of nasty things going on in nursing homes. And I'm urging the baby boomers to start using some of their energies to change some of these things. They can be changed. And I think they have to look at it. Would they like to go to a place where they would be happy while they're convalescent? Today, we know that most people, when they think of going to a nursing home, think they're going there to die. It should not be that way. I was in China, and I visited the Chinese nursing homes. They're called happy homes. Granted, we may not want to live like some of the older Chinese people, but they had a whole different ambience within the 
actual building. And we're starting to get there now. We're doing a lot of things about that. Remember, this, we are, we are going to be living in what I call the 21st year. It's like a revolution, the aging revolution. There are going to be one in every five people will be over 65. Right now, there's 72 million people turning 65, the boomers. So do we want the same thing, or do we want to reinvent it? We have a very, very smart population, and I think we can make it better. What was different in China that you feel that we should incorporate in our own system here in the United States? Uh, well, um, OK. For instance, uh, in the morning, I would carry, I was uh, lucky enough to be the oldest person in the group going to China. And I used to get up early, so I would carry the uh, video cameras on my back. At 6 o'clock in the morning with the video man, uh, we would see the elderly people who lived in small little rooms. They didn't have what we have today. Streaming down the streets, going to do Tai Chi, going to do exercise. Uh, being cared for in communities. Like in a community, there would be um, women who knew what was happening throughout the, whole, th throughout the whole neighborhood. If someone needed a uh, lunch or if someone needed something, there would be always someone going back and forth, taking care and looking at their older people. And besides that, the older people there are uh, looked upon in reverence. Like when I first got there and I was amongst hundreds, maybe a thousand students, they used to, they'd call me old one, old lady. At first I said, old lady, gee, I didn't like that. But that was a form of um, being respectful. And so they respect their elders um, and their happy homes. We were able to see only what they showed us, of course. I'm sure that uh, there wasn't abundance of everything, but people were smiling and laughing. And um, what would we, I guess what we would incorporate here is the compassionate, f the compassion that we all have within us to be shown to our elderly. And then I think the other thing is reverence towards the aged. Right now, we live in a society of ageism where only the youthful uh, appear in, in, our, in our radar, and the elderly are, or incapacitated, are people who are invisible. And that should change. My experience has been that most caregivers are not so much the men, but the women. It's like the, especially if they're married, men will give it to the woman to do doesn't matter if she's running a household, has her own job, she now has to take on the additional responsibility of the husband's parents and her parents. Absolutely. That becomes very, very stressful. What techniques would you suggest a person who's in that situation do so they're not so stressed out? They have to ask their loved ones and people in the family to help out somewhat. And if they can't do it, then hire someone. You know, women in particular have been the caregivers in our society. Men are now doing it. And let me tell you, I found that some of the men did a great job because they weren't so emotional. You know, they cut and dry, do this, do that, and do that, and they'd get it done. Where we tend to be a little bit emotional and uh, they are more businesslike. Um, like in my family, um, my brother uh, was not really involved too much with my parents as they grew older. He had his own family. He lived out of town. But when my father and mother were both ill, we had a meeting. And my brother came to the rescue. He took care of all the fine. I'm not good with money. He took care of all the financial aspects of it. He did his share. And the reason I'm saying that this is a wonderful thing is because when, when your parents or loved ones are gone, you will feel very uh, good about having done this. And they will also feel very good about having done their share. And you know, there's so much talk now about doing these caregiving. But um, I think if people are sort of addressed in the right way, it, they're willing to help. You know, you give one thing to one person, you get it back threefold. 
Uh, so I think, I don't believe you have to have grandchildren who are very young doing hard labor. You know somebody's about to pass away, whether it's eminent or down the road. How do you handle your situation, dealing with it, and comforting the person who's dying? Tell the truth, number one, that's a comfort. Um, and know that you will have time to grieve once the person is gone. Uh, be open and truthful. Um, I met with so many people who never would tell their parents that they were dying and would say, um, we'll see you tomorrow, Mom, when they knew that it may not even have been there the next day. And people would hang on. You know, we had a, a woman once whose daughter was getting married and she was about to die, and she had a very severe illness. And the doctors could not understand why she wasn't dying. She kept living. Well, the truth was, her granddaughter was getting married in about four weeks, and she wanted to make that wedding. We, as human beings, have the capacity to do that. So we had a mock wedding in the hospital on a Saturday, and the woman died very peacefully the next day. Um, so know that your loved ones can die peacefully and that you will have the time to grieve and during the time of this tremendous upheaval in your life when someone is dying know that you've given something to someone that no one else could ever give them to the person passes away what can you do to help yourself because you're in the state of oh I wish I did this I wish I did that why didn't I recognize this all these little things keep going through your head and you're trying to adjust to a new way of life. What would you say are some key points? I think uh, one of the key points is know that you've done the best that you can. Start making new friends. Uh, no, complete the mourning process. It, it doesn't go away in a week or a month. Some people take a year. And know that when you hear voices of your loved one or you you wish that they were there that that will pass it's all part of the process of mourning mourning is a very difficult time and we all everyone every religion every nationality has their own ways of mourning and expressing their grief and that everyone does it differently but it does take time and know that eventually the grief lifts and you're able to live again. And one of the key things is to start re-engaging with life, with friends, and surround yourself by people who love you, who will help you get through it, even if they're going through it. What advice would you give to aging daughters, elderly mothers, and I guess the grandchild? Because the grandchild can be in the situation where they're taking care of the mother and the grandmother. Absolutely. And you know, uh, that is the longest relationship you have, is your mother and daughter. And so the, for, the, for the aging daughter, caregiving can wipe out so many of the hurts from childhood if you work it through with your mother. And a grandchild will see this. And think about it. What would you want your daughter, your mother's granddaughter, to be doing for you? And if you think that way, it's a reciprocal process. And that process will get you through uh, one of the hardest things that you can do. But as a daughter, oftentimes, you're the only one that can give that mother, a dying mother or a sick mother, what she needs. Gloria, in the closing moments of the show, what would you like to leave the audience with? Say, don't be afraid to lend a hand to someone in need who is in need of caregiving, and not to be afraid. And once you've done it, there's a spirituality and a compassion that arises not only in yourself, that you will uh, find within your own self, but within your whole family network. And that 
um, in particular cases where you've really done a lot, you, you will feel relieved when the person is gone and you won't have any regrets and it will be very easy for you to go on and live your life. Thank you so much for joining me today, Gloria. Oh. It's been really quite informative and interesting. And I hope you are able to deal with a situation easily. And if not, write us here at The Woman's Connection. So we'd love to hear from you. And if you have any questions for Gloria or myself, please don't hesitate to write. Look forward to hearing from you. Bye now. Thank you.